Good morning. And as always, a very warm welcome. It is great to be together uh, worshiping the Lord in, in his house that is set apart for his purposes. So welcome. And uh, I want to just touch on a couple of uh, announcements before we begin. Uh, we do have, uh, and lo- these are listed in your bulletin, but we have online Bible study on Thursday mornings at 9 a.m. Uh, and if you would like to be involved in that, send me an email or call me up, and I'll, I'll be able to get your email into the system, and you'll get a link so that you can join us. Well, we found that uh, uh, online Bible studies like that, where you can see one another's faces, are really, really good. Uh, it's a way of having fellowship and seeing people talking about the Bible and everything. So that it's really working for that. It's probably going to change a lot of things in the church throughout the world permanently in some ways that we're going to be more and more uh, reaching out uh, uh, through Internet and, and those kinds of things. Uh, Grief Share, uh, which will be led by uh, Karen Keener, uh, is starting up next Sunday at 1 p.m. It goes to 3 p.m., and it will be in Husman Hall. Uh, our planning uh, council will meet on September 14th, 7 p.m. And uh, just uh, curious, is, will that be online or? Online. That will be online. Uh, Adriel George, who is our, our uh, uh, circuit uh, missionary, especially designated for international students and Muslims, uh, wants you to be, know that you are invited to Emmanuel Lutheran Church. They're going to have some kind of a boxed brunch uh, at 11 a.m. on Saturday, September 19th. Uh, and here is another 95th birthday. Helen wants to say thank you for everyone helping her celebrate that, her 95th birthday. But on September 27th, uh, Charlotte Sabatki is also celebrating her 95th birthday. So uh, please, you know, take your bulletins home. And uh, if you can, give her a call or send her a card or both. Uh, be a beautiful thing to do. I'd like to add a couple of prayer requests uh, and encourage you to use our website or email addresses or phone numbers. They're all on the back page of your bulletin uh, to share with us any prayer requests that you have. Uh, but one of the prayer requests I'd like you to be joining us in is uh, uh, Keith Whitty is pastor of Bethlehem Lutheran Church in uh, Fairborn. His wife, Allison, has stage four uh, breast cancer, uh, and uh, they have children at home. So please pray for Allison. And also uh, Redeemer Lutheran Church, which is up by Sydney, uh, their pastor took a call to Rogers City uh, in Michigan, and he's already gone. And they are struggling a little bit to try to find pastors to fill in for that congregation. So if you could also be praying for Redeemer Lutheran Church, uh, uh, that would be greatly appreciated too. So I invite you to take your bulletin, please. And our first hymn this morning will be from our gold hymnal. And if you would uh, look at the front page of your bulletin, you'll see Psalm 32, and we will do that responsive reading. So please stand with me as we begin. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin.
You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. And please stand, uh, remain standing for our first hymn. Please remain standing, and if you would switch to your brown hymnals, and we continue on page 151. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins unto God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, 
have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. Amen. Heavenly Father, we worship you and praise you for your wisdom and for all that you've done to preserve us as your people. Father, we pray that you would consider sending your son very soon because we desire his reign in all of his fullness to begin. We pray in Jesus' name. And please be seated.
Our first reading is from Ezekiel chapter 33. So you son of man, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them a warning from me. If I say to the wicked, a wicked one, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from his way. That wicked person shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, that person shall die in his iniquity. You will have delivered your soul. This is the word of the Lord. And this next uh, reading is uh, perfectly timed, Labor Day weekend, coming up on elections, and it speaks of, in from Romans 13, it speaks about government and God's plans uh, for our society. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the, the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes, to whom taxes are owed. Revenue, to whom revenue is owed. Respect, to whom respect is owed. Honor, to whom honor is owed. O no one anything except to love one, one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand with me for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. From Matthew 18. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, 
tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes be thrown into the hell of fire. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels always seek the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. This is the gospel of the Lord. And please be, uh, remain standing for our, our next hymn.
So, Father, we praise you and we acknowledge you in your presence. Help us to get to know you better as we meditate upon your word at this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And please be seated. With the elections coming up and a very crucial time for our country, I've been uh, praying about if and what uh, I should preach, and I've been thinking about principles of the Bible. I think it's always wise to stay away from politics in the sense of political parties or names of candidates, not because the law requires us to do that, but because you can turn off people's hearing aids, if you will, from listening to the gospel who may disagree. And besides that, the parties and the human beings are all imperfect individuals. So if you put, as the Bible says, your trust in princes and you identify one as our ultimate hero, uh, you're going to be disappointed, at least in some way. But the good thing is, is that the Bible does have some very clear principles about what is godly, what's from God, and, and what isn't. And one of the things that is fits right into the Bible is the concept of law and order. And I want to back up just a little bit in, uh, because this is a very interesting passage. It's about government here in Romans uh, chapter 13. But if you look at the chapter before and at the end of this chapter, uh, it's very similar. Let me read from uh, verse 2 in chapter 12 that, that comes before. It says, Do not be conformed to this world and don't be deceived the world system that is inspired primarily from human selfishness sinful nature and from satan himself is very different in so many ways uh, from god's ways so it says do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And that's just such good news to know that we can discern what God's will is for us. We can pray, we can inquire of the Lord, as it says so many times in the Bible, and ask him for guidance, and he will guide. Then in verse 16, it gives a paragraph uh, that kind of In my mind, it's like a Bible sandwich. You've got the meat in the middle, but you've got a context before, and you've got a context after, which is like bread, if you will. I probably shouldn't even go on there. But, but, but it, it, it forms the whole sandwich. It, it, you have to look at both sides to understand what God is saying. So in verse 16 is really, the chapter headings and verses are put in by humans. The words are from God, so you could just include these two together to make the whole sandwich. In 12 verse 16 it says, live in harmony with one another. So there's harmony and then there's discord. Harmony is from God it sounds beautiful. It's when different voices blend together in a gorgeous sound, it's some kind of things you kind of you search for almost in recordings to see special harmonies. They're working together uh, for one purpose. Discord is really horrible. I mean, and it, it can be like a, a cat scratching at a window or something or putting fingernails at across a chalkboard. Harmony is from God. Discord is not. So live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty. Pride never does good. But associate with the lowly. Never be conceited. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to, to do what is honorable in the sight of all. And that whole concept of honor is one that later we need to look at. Not this morning so much. If it possible, verse 18, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. We're called to live in peace with people as much as it depends on you. Sometimes it's impossible. 
Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. And please remember that one as we get into the meat of the passage here in a little bit. Uh, never avenge yourselves. Don't take the law into your own hands, but leave it to the wrath of God. If you just obey him that way and you love your neighbors, God will take care of the justice part of it. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will replay Repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So these are all principles of what the kingdom of God is like, what God is like, and, and for us living together in harmony, in harmony love, and, and so on. God is a God of order. I just want to take you back briefly to Genesis chapter 1 because everything starts in the book of Genesis. That affects us as we go on. It says, in the beginning, very first words of the Bible, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Uh, Kind of cool sounding Hebrew words there, tohu and vohu. And let me tell you what they mean. They're, tohu without form means, it can be translated as confusion, chaos. I think you could put the word anarchy if you start putting beings in with the, the chaos and so on. Tohu speaks about like wastelands and wilderness, which is always negative in the Bible. So the earth was without form and confusion, chaos, wasteland, and wilderness, and void. And that word basically means just an emptiness, a wasteland, and so on. And then it goes on to say, and darkness was over the face of the deep. Don't know for sure, can't prove that darkness, because sometimes darkness is <laughs> it's a good thing when you try to go to sleep at night. But spiritually, when you go through the Bible, darkness is almost always bad and light is almost always good. God is light. Uh, he is the light of the world. He has called you and me to be the light of the world. So that's an explanation. Some of us wonder, what was going on at this point with all this negativity, if you will, but it says the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, was brooding, uh, hovering uh, over the waters, over all of this chaos, if you will. And then God said, let there be light, the very first thing he says. And God also puts a seal of approval on this creation of light, and he says, and it was good. And this is what God is doing. Uh, he is bringing order from chaos, from disorder. He is bringing light from darkness and all these things. He's bringing good from bad. All was fine. We know about the Garden of Eden, and that is where God and the perfection was dwelling with man. There was no sin. There was no death. But very quickly in the book of Genesis we have the rebellion, and we have the fall. And that explains why God invented the need for government. And that's what Romans 13 is saying. This is something that has been instituted by God himself. And he also uh, instituted law I don't want to get off on another point. That probably could be another sermon, it might be. But uh, to give you an example, because the Bible talks about this too. It's like when we were children, the law was our tutor. Like an like a ankle kind of thing they put on a prisoner to make sure that, yeah, we trust you. So we're letting you out of prison for a while, but we want to just make sure. And we'll know that if you go somewhere, you're not supposed to go. And that's kind of what the law is for us. 
the reason law was necessary is if we had all this in our hearts and we were good, we would just automatically do what's right. But since we're not, we need to have some rules in place. You know, everyone would go the speed limit. Uh, you don't have to have speed limit signs. But because some, at least, will drive recklessly, we need to make rules. We need to beat laws. And God made laws and put it into effect. But it's really interesting, 1 Timothy chapter 1, because uh, what's happening is people are kind of falling away from the gospel, and they're really taking great pride in the law, and that's what makes us special is all the laws and the extra laws that we make that go beyond even the Bible because we're such a good people. And Paul is trying to say, listen, the law is good because it is God's will, but it wasn't created for good people. Listen to what he says, 1 Timothy chapter 1. The law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners. And you just think about some of these very self-righteous law, religious people hearing this. But Paul goes on, he says, the law is laid down for the unholy and the profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, and it keeps getting worse, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the glorious gospel of the blessed God. And one of the principles I'd like to look at you again is the whole concept of freedom. Freedom depends on having values and character and honor within us that can only come from Jesus and in that way, when we are a Christian country, can we really have freedom? But when we don't have any values, when we don't have any honor, when we don't have any respect, and basically we're letting our sinful nations then, freedom doesn't work. But on now to the, to the meat of the passage. Romans 13, it's still, every time I read this, it... Uh, it goes so much against at least my human nature kind of way of thinking that uh, it kind of stands out. But I read to you same, uh, from the same passage we read before. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God. God has given authority to imperfect human beings that are called and accountable to serve him. And there is no authority except from God. God is involved. And those that exist have been instituted by God. You know, we have the words of institution, which means the Lord started and set up what we call the Lord's Supper, which is a much more glorious institution than government. But he instituted government too. Therefore, Whoever resists, and notice that the word resist repeats itself several times. That is one of the campaign slogans of some folks is just resisting the authority and the government of the United States. Well, let's hear what God has to say about it. Whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. You can bet your life on it. Whoever resists what God has put into effect will incur judgment. That's a promise. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. And of course, we've got to say, unfortunately, sometimes there can be bad apples out there. There can be police or even soldiers or government officials that are bad. And a Christian nation, what we want to do is clean up house and do everything we can to prevent that from ever happening so that we can have honor and, and integrity and so on in our military and in our, our police. But in general, rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. In other words, if I'm going the speed limit and I'm coming to a full stop at the stop signs, I don't have to be looking around so afraid that there's a police car nearby. 
if I'm running red lights, running through stop signs, and I'm speeding, I always have to worry about a police car, and especially when the lights start going on uh, behind me. Rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. So Paul goes on to say, would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. By the word, that's, that's where the word minister comes from. We all, United States English, we think of minister as kind of like a religious, but it goes beyond that. It, a minister is a servant, and government authorities, police, military, soldiers, are God's ministers, servants. But then he goes on to say, but if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. And of course, if there isn't law and order, and one of the Proverbs, I didn't look it up for this message, but uh, it says if, uh, if there's not justice, if there's not enforcement of God's laws, that people just think they can get away with murder, basically. And that is what's happening in our country. There's people who think, well, I'll never get caught. They don't care. I'll never get convicted. Nothing wrong will ever happen. As a matter of fact, I can be a hero. Uh, and that's why God wants honest, genuine police and soldiers and government and politicians so we have a just society where it's not like if you have enough money or if you know the right people, you can get away with murder. But if you don't, the law will come down upon you. But it's supposed to be a fear of consequences when we break God's laws, which are meant to be set up for all of our good to protect us from chaos and disorder. So Paul says, if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. Now, of course, police and soldiers don't have swords with them anymore because we have much more effective weapons. But this is God giving the authority to police and to soldiers to bear arms and to be able to defend the weak and the helpless and those who need that help. He does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the, I will just say it, the minister of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Remember, it says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. But that doesn't mean he always does that firsthand. He has assigned people who are his ministers, who are police and soldiers, to carry out his wrath the policeman, the soldier, is the servant of God and avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subject not, not only to avoid God's wrath, because that's where God channels his wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. Now, I guess why this passage is so still shocking to my sensibilities whenever I read it, I don't know if it is for you, is because we have such imperfection in politicians, we have such imperfection in police departments, we have such imperfection in, in the military, and it seems so strong. But God's, and again, a Christian nation will say, we'll have God's values, and we'll want those upheld in the military, in the police, in all of our politicians. When you pray, and you pray for wisdom to vote, God, please give people who have a proper fear of you and your, help them to be actually afraid of knowing the accountability. It's a big privilege to be, have a gun put into your hand and saying you have the permission to kill. Help them to be so much knowing of, of your greatness and your accountability, that they'll know that they're being accountable. That's the kind of politicians we have that we want. Uh, no matter, and we don't know. I mean, people can be kind of phony, right? 
They can be fake. They say nice, real nice words. Or they say really bad words. But we want behavior and attitude that has a fear of God. Because we have imperfect people, and it's that fear of God. Here's an illustration. I, I, Penny's, my wife, uh, Lise, was running out on her car, so I've been urging her to, let's get this taken care of, not at the last second, but let's see what options are available for her, what's the best one, let's pray about it. So, uh, so uh, we went in, and uh, I believe God did lead us, but he had a lot more planned than that. I don't know how long we stood around listening to and sharing about spiritual things with one of the people who worked there, uh, and so on. And you know, even salesmen and everything, the, the, you, you, you can't necessarily trust them, right? Because they can have their self-interest at stake. And it was really interesting. I, I, I just kind of, we kind of made the decision what we were going to do. And I, uh, I said, can I ask you one question? He said, yeah. I said, if it was you or your own family or loved ones, what would you recommend them to do? And he took a keychain out of his pocket, which had a cross on it. He says, this cross reminds me to do what's right. And showing you this cross, I want to go, this is exactly what I would do. And I would, con- but you see, there is something there of a fear of God, a respect of God that was controlling what he said so he didn't just lie. And, and we need to pray that, we, that God will move hearts because we're being renewed the renewal of our mind is a continual thing. That people will have stronger fear of God, stronger knowledge of God's principles, and have that within their hearts. And we pray for all. We don't set up just, a, these are my enemies, I hate them, and these are the ones I like, and they're perfect. On the contrary, God has called us to be loving towards all and to pray for all. And this imperfection that we see in human government, you've got the books of First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. It's like the stories of heroes and villains. That could be a whole other sermon. But the reason God did that is he gave us history to show what was bad. And from God's view, there, there were some bad kings. And he said, this is why all this war came. This is why these things happened. Because the nation and the king, the way they were influenced and so on. And then they'd also show heroes. But we pray for God's wisdom and his conversion, if you will, on all of our leaders, no matter what. And parties, too. Parties are just as imperfect, and they change just like one human being to another. But anyway, I want to take you now to uh, our landing. And the gospel is our hope, and I want to read from Isaiah chapter 9, because this is when it's going to get all really good for us. That chapter reads and says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, darkness, symbolic and metaphorically is bad. The great light brings the hope. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy, and they rejoice before you. It talks about a nation. God creates nations. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. One day, the, we won't have a need for military soldiers anymore because there will be no war, because God will put his gospel in our hearts and things will be perfect. But here's the main thing. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. 
and the government, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and of peace. There will be no end. So, Father, we look forward to the return of your Son. Father, we thank you so much that you sent him into the world to be the perfect human being that you wanted us all to be. And he overcame all sin, and he paid the price on the cross for our sins. He died for our sins so that they are forgiven, and we have the gift of eternal life. So we have many, so many things already. But Lord, we long for Jesus, your return, when your kingdom will come in full and the government shall be upon your shoulder and you will be that perfect ruler for us forever. So we pray, come Lord Jesus and help us to know your word. Help us to be biblically literate and help us to have your values instilled within our hearts. And we pray that for our nation. In Jesus' name, amen. So at this point, we continue with the uh, Apostles' Creed. And it's found in a couple places, but it's also found in the back cover uh, of your, your hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So Father, we continue uh, with intercessory prayer. We thank you so much that you've given us the gift of prayer that changes the world. Will you change the world? And you wait upon us to pray to you. And Father, in light of this, we do pray for the government of our nation. We pray for our nation, the United States of America. We pray for a great awakening, a revival to come upon our nation. So we don't just look back historically that at one time we were people who had your values in our hearts, but you renew those values again and you change our hearts and minds. Fathers, I think about that. I, I pray for the folks we were able to speak to uh, at the car dealership. Lord, I pray for your continued inspiration and guidance and wisdom in their spiritual journey. And Father, we pray that you'd give us opportunities, however, to be able to bring the gospel of your kingdom because our hope is you, Jesus. Our hope is you, Spirit of God, as you bring the fruit of the Spirit in people's lives. Father, we thank you for what you have given us. And Lord, we pause uh, to bring our prayer request before you to uh, thank you for blessing uh, Helen Hussman, thank you for Charlotte's coming birthday, both achieving those years 95 years old. Lord, uh, you are prolonging our lives longer. You are giving us life, and we know one time, at one point we will have resurrection bodies that will last forever. So for that, we are so grateful. Lord, we pray for all those who can't or shouldn't be coming to church at this point. Lord, we list out all those loved ones in our bulletin. But Father, we continue to especially pray for uh, little Maria uh, to open up the opportunity for her to get a new heart. Father, we pray especially for Allison Whitty. Lord, Pastor Keith Whitty's uh, wife, that you would bring a miraculous healing. 
Father, we pray for Redeemer Lutheran Church and their need for pastoral care and a new pastor. We pray that you'd give wisdom and supply everything need, they need according to your riches and glory. So, Father, again, we, we admit that in our weakness, we don't know how to praise we ought, as you've shown us in Romans 8 and just through practical reality. But, Spirit of God, we thank you so much that you pray for us, in us, through us, with such passion and groans that I can't even be put into words. We thank you and praise you. Lord, we pray the wonderful prayer that your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is in our gold hymnal. Please stand as we sing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.